All right, and welcome back for another video on pre-calculus. Today's lecture is on section 1.5, equations. Um, we've seen lots of expressions before. We've even seen equations before. An equation is just uh, one expression, say 1 plus 5, together with another expression, say 6 plus 3 minus 3. Uh, and when we throw this symbol in between them, we can mean, I guess, one of two things. We can either say, for a fact, this is true, right? Um, and in fact, you know, we always want it to mean that whatever's on the left is in fact the same as whatever's on the right. So we want to be careful with that. But oftentimes in your book or other places, this is seen as a question, right? Is there an equality? Okay. So I want to I want to make sure that we always use it for true equality, um, or in a situation where the context makes it obvious that it might not be true. Um, but in today's lecture, we'll just be looking at solving equations primarily, uh, s primarily linear equations and quadratic equations. Quadratic. Um, is another name for uh, uh, second degree polynomials um, or for parabola, right? But the quadratic is a second degree polynomial, something that looks like ax squared plus bx plus c. That's an expression. When we set it equal to zero, we make it an equality. Okay, so uh, when we find a solution for an equation, uh, what, we're, what we're finding is a value or a set of values that makes the equality true, right? I can write something like x plus 1 equals 5, and that is not always true, right? This is only true when x equals 4. It's not true for any other value for x. It's only true when x is 4. So solving means finding all of those values, whatever they are. Okay, and it usually involves rewriting any equality in certain ways. So first, let me just write down a few properties. Let's say we've got an equation, A equals B. We can add a constant to both sides, and it does not change the truth of the equality. Adding a constant to both sides does not change the truth of the equality. Right? So if I have two numbers that are in fact equal, if I add a number to both sides, the same number, we still have an equality that is true, right? Three does equal three, right? So adding a number to both sides does not affect a thing. In symbols, a plus c is equal to b plus c. That's equivalent to a equaling b, right? So a equals b is equivalent. to a plus c equaling b plus c. Another property is multiplication. So if we start with a equals b again, and if we multiply both sides by a constant, the multiplication does not affect the truth of this equality. If a is b, then 
A times C equals B times C. Okay. Um, there's a caveat here. Uh, there's there's one situation where this does not hold, and that's where we've destroyed information. <laughs> so we can start with a true equality like this, zero equals zero, and we can say that well C is zero, right? And A is actually two, and B is actually three, right? So it's true that zero does equal zero. Check. But it is not true that 2 equals 3. So there's a caveat here. If you see 0 times 0, that doesn't mean that A equals B. If you see 0 equals 0, that doesn't mean that we can, you know, say whatever we want for A and B being true. So just one little thing to be aware of. And that's basically it for solving linear equations. We've got these two properties that multiplying both sides of an equation by a number or adding some number to both sides of the equation, it doesn't affect the truth of the equation. So we're going to go ahead and start with solving linear problems, linear equations. Whenever you see a polynomial that's got a number times a variable plus a number, so a good example would be like 2x plus 1, or 2x minus 1, or negative 2x plus 1, or negative 2x minus 1. These are all the same. These are all uh, uh, some number times x plus or minus another number. Okay. These are called linear equations when you say y equals ax plus b. When you make, when you throw in inequalities there with something else, that's a linear equation. And we can solve linear equations using the two properties that we saw above. So let's try and solve one here, and we'll just see how we can apply those two rules there um, for solving linear equations. So first example will just be solve, which means find all of the values of x, which make this true. 4x minus 3 equals 5. Got a linear equation on the left and a constant, a linear expression on the left and a constant on the right of this equation. So we're just going to apply those two rules. And the general rule is to try and, with linear equations, try and isolate the variables. That means to try and move everything that's not a term with a variable to one side and move everything else to the other side of the equality. Um, I see oftentimes students drawing vertical lines like this and then drawing stacked equal signs to try and keep track of like left and right side. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate that here. I see in this first line that there's a 4x minus 3. So let's go ahead and make that 0 by adding 3. And then on the other side, we'll also add 3. That doesn't, t that doesn't change the truth of the equality at all. It rewrites it. 4x plus 0 is 4x. 8 is 5 plus 3. So now whenever this is true, 4x is 8 is true, we know the top equation is true. Um, I'm going to uh, try and get this into just an x on the left side instead of 4x. The way I'll do that is multiplying by 1 fourth or dividing by 4, whichever way you want to think about it. 4x times 1 fourth is x. 8 times 1 fourth, or 8 divided by 4, is 2. So whenever you multiply both sides of an equation by some number, which is not 0, truth is maintained. So whenever x is 2 is true, then 4x must equal 8, then 4x minus 3 must equal 5. So we found here the solution that x is 2 by just applying our two rules that we saw before, adding numbers to si both sides of an equation and multiplying both sides uh, on an equation by the same number. Okay, that's solving a linear equation. It's one of the, it's one of the simpler things to do in this section.
Um, the next harder thing to do is solving uh, j just, you know, uh, anything, no matter what it is. Uh, we're going to still deal with, um, in, this, in this next example, we're going to still deal with just variables of the first power. Um, but we're going to introduce a chemistry equation here, the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume is nRT. Number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. This is the ideal gas law. And uh, it describes how changes in temperature or changes in number of moles of a gas or the volume and pressure of the gas are all related, right? And there's several laws that build into this. Um, but this is the ideal gas law. We can still solve this even if it's um, even if it's not numerical, right? R is actually a constant, but n and t and p and v these are all variables. We can still solve this for whatever variable you choose. So let's let's solve this for p, the pressure. Well, we see on the left side of the equation, p is multiplied by v. V is just a variable for the volume of the gas. That's just a number, right? So p times v is nRT. Based on the rules we saw before, we can multiply both sides of this equation and we won't change the truth of it, right? So if PV is in fact equal to nRT, then we can multiply by one over V on both sides. That's the same as dividing by V and the truth is not changed. So any any solution will look like this, right? If you take a temperature of a gas, if you take a moles amount of, for a gas, if you take the volume of a gas, and you perform that computation, n times r times t divided by v, if the pressure is that, then you've got yourself a solution. If the pressure is not equal to that, then you don't have a solution. So here we, we've, we've got no values, we've just got variables, and you can still solve for a specific variable if you want to, um, like we've done here, solving for P, there it is. You can still solve for it using the, the two rules that we saw before. Okay? Sometimes that's called solving for one variable in terms of another, right? We had one variable in terms of three, on the other side, up here, we had one variable solved in terms of one, two, three on the right. So it's solving for one variable in terms of a, another. Okay, the next kind of equation that we want to be able to solve is something called a quadratic equation. This is, as I wrote before, quadratic is a polynomial of second degree. So it's a some number, like 2x squared plus b times x, that's just another number, so 3x maybe, plus c, which is just another number, which we'll say maybe, for example, is 5. So if I wrote something like this, 0 equals 2x squared plus 3x plus 5, how would you solve for those x's, which make this true? And there's a few ideas that we want to be able to use for this. The first one, I think I said in the last lecture, it's called the zero, zero product property. It's really simple. It says if you have two numbers, A times B, or any number of numbers that are multiplied together and they give you zero, then we know that either A equals zero or B equals zero or both a equals b equals zero right this is just kind of the obvious statement that in multiplication zero kills everything <laughs> so if you have a product that is zero something must have 
killed it, right? If A is not zero, then B better be zero for that product to be zero. Um, so how can we use this? This property, well, let's let's just think about it in terms of a quadratic that maybe we can we can factor. So let's say I wanted you to solve this. X squared plus 5x is 24. Can we factor this in its current form? Eh, not really, right? But we can adjust it. We can perform operations like subtracting from both sides of the equation, giving us something equivalent. This looks closer to the zero product property now. We've got no product over here, but we've got a zero on the right side. So that looks close. So let's go a little further. Can we factor this left side? Uh, if it's going to factor, it's going to factor like this. An x and an x. And what goes here and here better be the factors of 24. And then they need to add to 5. So I think 8 and 3 probably is the right way to go here. 8 times 3 is 24. The negative sign makes it a negative 24, so that's taken care of. Okay. 8 minus 3 is 5, so this is taken care of. So this is the factorization of x squared plus 5x minus 24. And now here we've got a zero product property uh, to use, right? Some number times some number is zero, so one of those numbers must be zero. So either x plus 8 equals 0, or x minus 3 is 0. So I, th I think this is rather obvious. We subtract 8 from both so sides here, and we get x is negative 8. On the right, we, s we add 3 to both sides, we get x is 3. So either x is negative 8 or x is 3. And that those two are our solutions we think back to our original problem, 3 works for that, right? 9 plus 15 is 24. And negative 8 works. We get 64 minus 40 is, in fact, 24. So this last set of equations was equivalent to this, the factorization, which was the same as that, equivalent to that which is equivalent to this. You know, if these bottom ones are true, then everything above are true. Right? So we're just creating a logical chain here. If this thing is true, then this and this and this and this must be true, but the last thing we know how to solve, so we solve it. And then we conclude that the thing at the beginning is true when that thing is solved too. So this is a common way of solving quadratics, is you factor them and then you use the zero product property. Um, but that doesn't always work, right? Uh, sometimes you need to do something called completing the square. This is another technique to solving quadratics. Completing the square. And it's the one that gives students headaches most often, more often than not. Um, uh, and you're going to learn the general pattern in a little bit with something called the quadratic formula. But first, we'll just look at this thing called completing the square. So this is based on the pattern that we've seen before, which is if you take two numbers and you add them and square them, you always, always, always get something that has a nice pattern to it. It's always a squared plus 2 times the product of those things plus b squared. The first one squared the last one squared, and then two times the product of those things. It's always this way. Okay? Always, always, always. So completing the square deals with this, and um, we usually write it in a different way. It's usually written like this. So this looks a little odd, but it's going to take care of that 2 that was in the middle there. So it's this. x squared plus bx plus 
b over 2 squared is x plus b over 2 squared. So if you compare this to the previous one, we've got an a and we've got something else, but now that something else is just something divided by 2. And if you remember, that would have given us a plus 2ac plus c squared, but that division by 2 gets rid of that 2 there, right? So this is a b over 2, and that cancels with that 2. So this is just a little bit different, but it, it's, it's a sort of a convenience form here. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in a problem, and then uh, you'll sort of see, you'll get the idea. But completing the square is not some formula that you follow necessarily. It's something that you do. It's something that you can, it's a technique you can use to create a perfect square. And it involves this term here primarily. Usually you're not given that term and you need to determine what that term should be. So here we go. x squared minus 8x plus 13 is 0. We want to solve this. And the hint is we're going to have to complete the square. So if this were, if this were a perfect square, this would factor, right? This would factor perfectly into something like x minus something squared. But as it is, this does not factor in that way. So my question is this. What number do we want here instead of a 13 so that it does factor into a perfect square? And your hint is at the top of the screen, right? It's 8 divided by 2 squared. So this is our b. And we're going to divide it by 2. We're going to add that. We're going to add the square of that to both sides of the equation. Or maybe we can find it somewhere else. That's another sort of way to do it. But what we want it to be is we want it to be 16, which is 8 over 2 squared. That's what we want it to be. Okay, so let's, let's just do it the simplest way first. We're going to add 16 to both sides. I got 16 by taking half of 8, which is 4, and squaring it to get 16. What this does for us is this, x minus 4 squared that is that. It factors into that perfect square. Plus 13 equals 16. Subtract 13 from both sides. And then we've got some number squared is 3. So that number can be one of two things. It can be either square root 3, or it can be negative root 3. Right? If you square root 3, you get 3. If you square negative root 3, you still get root 3. So the number that we squared was either of those. So we've got two possibilities here. We've got that x minus 4, that's the number that we squared, is either equal to root 3 or x minus 4 is equal to negative root 3, and that, that basically hands us our solutions. x is 4 plus root 3, or x is 4 um, minus root 3. It's one of those two. Okay. We can go back and we can check our results if, we, if we'd like to, um, but this, is, this technique of completing the square it's basically this step right here and this step right here. Right? It's figuring out what you need to add to both sides so that 
the variables factor into a perfect square so that then you can essentially take a square root of both sides to solve. Okay. So that is completing the square. Now if you did this in general, if you took just a, a any old quadratic, you set it equal to zero and you solved this. And then you completed the square you would get x plus b over a x plus b over 2a squared plus c over a equals b over 2a squared if you did this whole thing dot 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 you kept going and you said you know you got x plus b over 2a squared equals what do you have you've got on the left side You've got negative c over a plus b squared over 4a squared. If you kept going, what you would have is something that's called the quadratic formula. Which is a formula. It's not something that you, you do, like completing the square, but it's a formula that says if you have a quadratic, any quadratic, like this, a quadratic equation. A is some number times x squared, b is the number times x, c is the number added on to the end. Then the form of the solution is always like this. It's the opposite of b, whatever that number is, plus or minus. So remember, before we had two possibilities, plus root 3 or negative root 3. That's the plus or minus. The square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all divided by twice a. Right? It's just a formula that says given any quadratic formula, any quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, this is how you calculate x. This is how you just calculate it. So it's something that is commonly memorized by students of mathematics. Um, because it comes up so often, it is something that is just memorized. Um, it's one of the very first programs that you might have learned to, to do back in high school uh, on a computer. You know, calculate the, uh, program something to calculate the uh, solutions to a quadratic formula. Um, so, it, right, it's just what it is, right? Um, there's a nice little song that you can sing to uh, the song Pop Goes the Weasel. You can sing this to that tune and you've got um, a nice memorization device there for you. But there's one thing that I wanted to point out. It's just a sort of a sort of a caveat here. Sometimes quadratics don't have real number. There's the V there. Real number solutions. Sometimes they don't. So I could I can give you a, a graphical picture here, but I I want to avoid that actually at this point because um, we haven't learned how to graph things yet. So I don't know that you'll make the connection between the two. But this equation can make sense, I suppose. We know that x, if there's a solution to the quadratic equation, it looks like this. So we calculate it in that way. But right up here we've got a square root of something. We've got the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So square root of b squared minus 4ac. Let me just fabricate something for you. What if we had a um, what if we had a, this quadratic? We've got 10 x squared plus 1x plus I have no idea let's just go with another let's go with another um, 10 at the end so now let's compute this one little piece of the quadratic formula square root of 1 squared because b is 1 minus 4 times a 
which is 10, times c, which is 10. So this is the square root of 1 minus 400. It's a square root of negative 399. And the square root of a negative number is not a real number. That's an imaginary number. It's, it's a complex number. Okay. In this case, we've discovered that there's, there, there's no real solution here. In this quadratic, there's no real solution. If you are a good student and you plug in all the values in the right places, you will not get a solution that is a real number. And so this, this smaller piece of the quadratic formula has a special name. It helps you tell, uh, tell certain situations apart. Uh, we call that discriminating, right? So to discriminate or tell things apart. In social context, it has a sort of a different meaning, right? But to discriminate between two things is to tell things apart. So b squared minus 4ac, if that is positive, or if that is 0, or if that is negative, discriminates for us between the different solution sets. So if b squared minus 4ac is negative, like we just saw in that previous example, there are no solutions, no real solutions. So if you just, you know, take any quadratic formula and you compute this and you find that b squared minus 4ac is negative, you can stop right there. There's no real solutions. So this should be the first thing that you do, right? Because you don't have to go any further. If b squared minus 4ac is 0, then back up in the equation, the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of it is 0 over 2a. You've got one solution, and it's the opposite of b over 2a. So one solution, the opposite of b over twice a. Okay. So this discriminant discriminant helps us to discriminate between there being no solutions or there being one solution or in the last case when b squared minus 4ac greater than 0 if it's positive there are two solutions right two solutions the opposite of b plus the square root of it and the opposite of b minus the square root of it all divided by twice a. So the, the discriminant is the thing that discriminates between all three of these different scenarios and um, uh, it can be really helpful right in just being sort of a, uh, a first check. It's the first thing you should check when you've got a quadratic formula in front of you. Um, there's other kinds of equalities that you'll come uh, you'll come into contact with with absolute values and and uh, with square roots and things like that um, but there's no general theory in this section for those problems so we are just going to um, we're just going to um, stop here and in the problem session uh, during the next class day we're going to go through several of those problems so uh, you'll see how those work but for now, that's, that's it for section 1.5, and that's it for the, the videos for the rest of the week. So I hope that helps, and uh, I'll see you again next week, okay? I'll see you later.